as it pertains to uh, September 11th. So I'm, I'm just going to give you some details about my eyewitness experience. So here I was, a new mom, just had my son uh, two and a half months prior. I returned to work September 11, 2001. I started my morning. <laughs> what a way to say, welcome back. <laughs> so I start my morning with chai tea. That's my thing. I love chai tea. It's really good, especially mixed with, with milk. And so I'm still torn, like, oh, God, here's my first day. And I thought my only worry was going to be starting back at work. So I make my ride to the Pentagon. I get a phone call on my cell phone. Okay, April, we need you to go ahead and come on into the office, and then you can take Elijah to the daycare later. And I'm thinking, how am I going to get my son cleared, <laughs> you know, to, to get back there to do what you want me to do? So, of course, you know, subordinate. Well, can I make a recommendation? How about I take him to the daycare first and then come back um, and do what it is that you want me to do? But, again, I wasn't subordinate, so I have to do as I, I'm told to do. And I was told, no, how about you get them back here and you do what we want you to do. Then you take them to the daycare. And I'm like, okay. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, he's not going to get cleared to get back there, so I'm going to get to get him to take him to the daycare anyway, so I'm just going to look like I'm following what I'm told to do. So I go to the security station. I'm like, well, they told me I have to bring my son back here. I already know he's not going to get cleared, but I want to make sure I come to you first so you can call them and tell them. So... I'm thinking he's going to say, oh, yeah, you're right. We can't clear him to get back here on that particular day. No, go ahead on back there. <laughs> we went through in, in the shortest amount of time ever in getting through to the Pentagon. So that automatically sent up some red flags to me because I was thinking, like, why in the world and how? You know, I'm thinking about those things, but I'm like, okay, I'm going to go ahead. So I move forward. I get to the desk. Um, my supervisor tells me I'm going to go to a meeting. When I get back, you and I are going to talk. And I'm like, okay, so you're going to a meeting. You have me come back here so you can go to a meeting. Okay, fine, no problem. So I take my son's stroller. I put it beside the desk. I go to touch the computer button, you know, to turn on the computer. Boom! That's exactly how it happened. There was no extra uh, additional things. It was just like that. I taken my son put his stroller beside my desk, I went to turn on the computer, boom. And at that moment, our life was completely changed on that particular day. Now, here's what I feel like the details that you need to know. When I came to, of course, I was disoriented. I didn't know what had happened, what was going on. I was covered in debris from the, my, the, the back of my neck all the way down to my body. So the only thing that was out was my arms and my head. I shake my head, like, what is going on? What happened? Then all of a sudden, I can hear my son crying. He's crying louder and louder and louder. And I'm sure, moms, you know about this. When, when our, our children get in distress, all of a sudden, we get that super strength, like, we need to find out what's going on, you know. So he stopped crying, and that's what motivated me to low crawl or really pull myself out from under the debris, move all the debris, and get from under the debris because he had stopped crying. So my first thought was, oh, my God, I come back to work to lose my child. Regardless of the fact, I was able to get out, and there were a number of things that were going on at that time. There were people who were covered under debris. They were trapped in between the floors saying, help me, save me. Um, screaming. I mean, there were so many things going on at one particular time, and I was split. I had a duty and an obligation, because I was in the military, I had a duty and obligation to help save these people. And then here's my child, who now had stopped crying. I'm split, my child, people, child, people. So it's very hard. I was reaching under the debris to see if I could reach my child, to see if he was in the immediate area. I couldn't feel him. So then I thought, okay, I'm going to help save some of these people so they can help me find my kid. I, I, I couldn't find him. I tried. I was reaching under the debris. I couldn't. We get to the point where things were collapsing, and my other coworkers, who, who we still stay in touch with today, were like, we have to go now. We have to go now. But I was thinking I didn't have my son. And at that point, I just wanted to leave with his body. So we get to a big just pile of debris. And I had one leg over the pile of debris. And they were holding my arm. It was like two people holding the other long arm, telling me, come on, pulling me, saying, come on. I'm like, I, I just got to try just one more time. And I reached down just 
sheer chance, no science to it, no method to it. I just reached down and I grabbed my son's onesie and I pulled the onesie up and I put them over my shoulder and then they pulled me by the other arm and then as soon as they pulled me out over that place of debris, that area, more things had collapsed in that area. So it just all happened in time enough for us to really get out. And so I'm very, you know, very grateful that. But there was no science to it. There was no method to it. There was no strategy, no plan. It just, it just simply happened. Now here's what was key. As we were moving out, I was still able to see pillars that were still holding up the actual area. I mean, not very many. You know, there was some still knocked down. There were still wires. I, I didn't see any plane debris. I didn't see any airplane seats. I didn't see any metal. I didn't see any baggage. I wasn't covered in jet fuel. I know the people that we helped pull out under the different floors, I didn't see them covered in any jet fuel. I, you know, I, I just didn't see it. And so at the time, after the fact, that's all I was thinking. That's what I didn't see. But I know what I saw. And most of the debris that we, we, we were encompassed with or what we were going through was pertaining to office things. Concrete, books, computers, tables, things of that effect. So we get out on the lawn as we come out of the, the actual hall where they claim that's where the plane entered. Um, as I come out, I'm thinking all of a sudden someone had taken a hammer and literally beat me from my head all the way down to my feet, and then I collapsed. There was a gentleman who was helping people as they were coming out. He captured my son as I was going down to the ground. He got a gentleman to help hold Elijah while he moved me to another location on the lawn. Now, I really don't know how they determine rank structure because I had my civilian clothes on, but most of the higher, you know, ranking people who had been affected were already transported out for triage, and we were left on the ground. So the people who were surrounding us was just trying to stop cars to get us to the hospital. But while I was on the lawn, I can't say that I saw a silver piece of a plane part. I didn't see any of that, and that's the only thing that I really feel like I can attest to because those are things that I, I, I didn't see. Um, so with that in mind, I would have never have believed that it was a plane simply because I didn't see particular things. And based off the Pentagon renovation team, they did a mapping of where everybody was and what was the feet uh, or where they were located to determine how far away they were from an impact. And I was just communicated to me we were maybe 35 to 45 feet away from place of impact, more or less three or five feet. So I feel like, you know, if that's the case, surely there would have been something to support particular things. But again, I stick to, you know, my account and the things that I saw. I don't know what was more horrifying. I don't know if it was actually having the experience or the life, you know, after 9-11. Of course, they wanted to... Um, train us or specifically communicate to us how they wanted us to express what is a story, what happened, and I couldn't do that because these were things that I know I did not see. So I could not support their official story because there were things that I did not see. And I can't say that they specifically communicated that I will not say this and that I will not say that, but I can say, you know, we, they wanted to ensure that we communicated things as you know, they made the official story. I'm sure many of you are aware of what the official story is. And I just couldn't do that based off, you know, what I saw on the inside. Also, the other inappropriate thing was the fact that my two-and-a-half-month child was clear to go back there. That was the other, the other number two. They didn't want me to communicate that my son had been injured in that particular location. They felt like that was very inappropriate for me to share with the public. And again, I could not do that because then how would my son get his continuous care? How would he get his treatment? I mean, what was I going to tell the doctors? What was I going to say? How was I going to explain how he got hurt? He had a sunken, you know, when they're newborn babies, their head is already soft, but a large portion of his head had been sunken in. Plus, he was bleeding from the nose. Um, you know, there were just, just issues. And so it wasn't when I was asking those particular questions, I was given specific answers. It was the fact that they didn't make particular statements. What was I supposed to say? What was I supposed to tell the doctors? And if you didn't want to address that, then again, that was, again, a red flag. One of the things I know that you're probably concerned about, in reception and integration at the Pentagon, 
we're told that this is one of the safest buildings in all of the United States of America. It's part of your reception and integration. You're given a tour of the Pentagon. You're told particular things about the Pentagon. So I'm believing I'm working in one of the safest buildings in all of the United States of America. But on that particular day, there was no alarms, there was no alerts, and there was no warnings. Now, backstepping, while I worked at the Pentagon, they had drills so often that it became very annoying. I don't, I, you know, it's like a maze in there, and when you have to get a document to one place in the building to the other end of the building, and you have a very short period of time to do it, and then there's, uh, you know, <laughs> some type of training or some type of alert or some kind of practice drill, and you have to stop to participate in that drill, yes, it becomes very annoying. So here we have this particular day, and there was no alarms, no warning, and I just asked myself, what is the probability on that particular day, no alarms, no alerts, no nothing on that one particular day? Now, what did work was the doors inside the building that trapped other people in, and they couldn't get out. Those doors worked, and that's why some people were just pretty much burned to death. So we have to really look at these things and not question it as a sense of being unpatriotic, but that's, that's enough to raise concerns to. And then when you look at that building, there are certain things that's not supposed to even come within a certain radius of the Pentagon without some type of alert or some type of warning. But this object that they claim to say was a plane was able to not only get in that radius, but also able to even touch the Pentagon lawn and hit the building. That really blows my mind based off the money that goes into surveillance and that goes into security measurements and, and how, you know, this particular day absolutely nothing was working. Because trust me, if I got a warning, I would have been willing to jump out of a, build, a window to get out of that building on that particular day to save my kid. So, it, it, you know, those things cause uh, a lot of questions and a lot of concerns for me. And it put me on this journey uh, to get to the truth, but not only that, to bring forth justice. And I think it's great, you know, what a lot of people are doing um, to help uh, perpetuate us to get to this, to this point, because it is very necessary. Um, I know that is a big issue. Was there any um, alerts or any warnings? And there, there, were, there were none none whatsoever and it's hard to even believe considering the World Trade Center had already been attacked and they have a room where they watch what's going on all around the world in different time zones and in different countries and they know that the World Trade Center has been attacked and then they don't even say hey everybody we need to get up on arms or, or something of, of something do something the probability of them not doing that considering the, the level of uh, security they have and capabilities they have, what is the probability? So I had put out this task. I said, if someone could give me what is the probability of nothing working on one particular day, I would do one thing that they would ask me, as long as it wasn't unlawful, as long as it wasn't distasteful, and as long as it was something that was reasonable that we all could have come to agree with. And to this day, no one has been able to give me what, would, what is the probability of um, nothing actually working on that day. Um, again, I was selected, for the, the Pentagon selects people from all walks of the life. I was selected from the military. I was, I was in Heidelberg, Germany, and I was selected from the hospital. And so I had a very different perception of military, the country, everything. I had such a different perception until, you know, after that particular day. And I really wasn't one to question particular things until that particular day happened. I come from a military family. Our family and our generations in our family have served our country. We believe in serving God, country, and man. And I, and I still believe that, but I don't believe in, in particular things um, as far as misusing the military or, or perpetuating lies to, uh, again, misuse the military. Um, but I still believe that we, we have a duty to do particular things. So it was very disappointing to have the experience and then to, to live the life after 9-11. And I hope my personal testimony or my personal experience will help answer many of the questions that some of you may have been having regarding the Pentagon.